Morning everyone. This video is part of a series that explores Ozymandias by Percy Bysshe Shelley. This particular video is all about the structure and the form. We'll discuss different types of the sonnet form and look at a few more generic structural features. As always, there's a link in the description to the other videos in the series, as well as a link to the slides if you want them. Let's get started. It's worth mentioning that structure and form are areas that are often neglected by the majority of students. So they're areas that are ripe for gaining extra marks. If it's an area that not many people discuss, it's an area that will be easier to discuss original ideas and concepts for. Form and structure are closely linked because you usually need to look at the structure in order to determine the form. Form is the overarching structure of a poem rather than individual word level structural features. So for example, a poem could take the form of a limerick, a haiku or an acrostic poem. In the case of Ozymandias, the form is that of a sonnet, but with a twist. So let's now take a look at some more specific structural features. First off, just look at the poem. We can already see that it's one full stanza, an unbroken symbol of power in itself. Note that when Ozymandias speaks in lines 10 and 11, the emphasis shifts. He puts the stress syllable at the beginning of the line, so it becomes look on my works, as opposed to look on my works. This is different to the other lines of iambic pentameter, such as line one's I met a traveler. This could be used to show the power and strong command of Ozymandias. An obvious feature of the poem, but one that many students overlook, is the fact that it begins in first person, using the pronoun I. But then it quickly moves into reported speech when the traveller begins speaking in line two. So unlike many of the other poems, we don't really get a sense of who this speaker is. Think about in Browning's My Last Duchess. The whole poem is the Duke discussing a piece of art, and we get a fascinating insight into the speaker's psyche. Here in Ozymandias, we get a poem discussing a piece of art, the statue, but no sense of the narrator. Choosing to use this point of view distances the reader from the narrator, and also distances us from the ancient topic of the poem. It also means that Shelley can make criticisms of those in power as they are not his words, they're just the travellers. It's interesting how Shelley holds back Ozymandias' voice until line 10. By line 10, we've heard about the cold command, the frown, the wrinkled lip, the sneer, the mocking, and how the sculptor must have taken a disliking to Ozymandias. Enough to carve a stone so well that we get an impression of what Ozymandias was actually like thousands of years later, much later than Ozymandias' power. And because we've read this negative semantic field, we've already built up an impression of what Ozymandias was like. And then we read the pedestal, and we find out that he's just as arrogant, if not more arrogant, than we originally thought. Interesting as well that Shelley is able to control when Ozymandias speaks. As powerful as the pharaoh was, it's Percy who's in charge here. And next, we've got the juxtaposition. Think about the significance of placing the quotation, Look on my works, ye mighty in despair, so close to nothing beside remains. This latter part is the shortest sentence in the whole poem, a simple sentence. It could show that Shelley wants to emphasize his point through juxtaposition. You may have a long, complex and powerful sentence detailing all that you have achieved, but what is left? Nothing beside remains. This short tenure and short reach of influence is shown by the short sentence, which creates a sense of irony. He wants us to look at his accomplishments in despair, but there's nothing left of it. Nothing beside remains is supposed to juxtapose everything that came before it, supposed to show that as powerful as he was, Ozymandias isn't much now. And now that we've looked at some of the generic features of the poem, let's look a little deeper at the different types of sonnets the form of the poem. Generally, sonnets consist of 14 lines. They're written in iambic pentameter, which means there are five sets of two syllables, 
with a second syllable in each pair stressed. They are usually used to express feelings of love, and they usually end in a rhyming couplet. There are two standard types of sonnets, Petrarchan, named after Petrarch, and Shakespearean, named after Shakespeare, believe it or not. These types have their own conventions, however Shelley doesn't really stick to the conventions of either style. As stated earlier, romantic poets rebelled against the rules and conventions of poetry at the time. This could be one of Shelley's rebellions against the rules of his day. Not only does he rebel against the rules of society, but by making a poem that alludes to the British Empire, perhaps he is rebelling against the establishment too. Now a Petrarchan sonnet consists of an octave, which is an eight line section, and then a sestet, which is a six line section. These are divided by the volta. The volta can be found in poems other than sonnets too, it's just the turning point in a poem. Here the rhyme scheme is ABBA, ABBA for the octave, followed by either CDCDCD or CDECDE for the sestet depending on the poet. On the other hand, we have a Shakespearean sonnet. The Shakespearean sonnet is sometimes called an English sonnet, and is characterised by three quatrains, now a quatrain is a four-line section, and finished off with a rhyming couplet, which is a two-lined rhyme. The rhyme scheme of a Shakespearean sonnet is typically ABAB, CDCD, EFEF, GG. However, in contrast to all of the rules that came before him, Shelley decided to combine the rules of Shakespearean and Petrarchan sonnets, as well as throw in a few rules of his own. He seems to use the Petrarchan structure of the Volta between the 8th and 9th lines, as shown in orange here. Then he begins the poem with an ABAB quatrain reminiscent of a Shakespearean sonnet, as shown in purple here. However, he then adds his own rhyme scheme, as shown in blue here. And Petrarchan and Shakespearean sonnets both use iambic pentameter, as previously discussed. However, Shelley dips in and out of this. He definitely uses pentameter, meaning there are five pairs of syllables on each line. Pent comes from the ancient Greek word meaning five, like a pentagram, the five-sided shape. Lots of Shakespeare's plays use iambic pentameter for the noble characters such as kings and other people of power, so by using iambic pentameter it is, in itself, a symbol of power. For example, who said, to vast and trunkless legs of stone. This uses iambic pentameter. There are five pairs of syllables, and every second syllable is stressed. However, there are other lines in Ozymandias that do not use the standard sonnet form of iambic pentameter. For example, in the line, nothing beside remains round the decay, the opposite of an iamb where the second syllable is stressed is called a troche. A troche is where the first syllable in a pair is stressed, and that is used in this line with the word nothing. The fact that Shelley refuses to commit to iambs or trochees in this line alone suggests that he is flouting the traditional or the established rules of poetry, particularly sonnets. He also flouts the tendency to make sonnets a love poem. Or does he? Does Shelley seem to admire the power that Ozymandias held? If Shelley is learned in the forms of poetry, which he was, why do you think he decided to flout the rules of form and metre? Particularly around the lines where he gives Ozymandias a voice by reading out the pedestal. Could it be that he wanted to make a statement about the established rule? Not necessarily just Ozymandias, but rulers in general. Could it be that he wanted to show the deterioration and breakdown of the rules of poetry? and link this to the breakdown in the rule of Ozymandias, and rulers in general. Perhaps link it to the breakdown in power of civilization. It's up to you what you want to attribute Shelley's choices to. 
Overall, be thinking about how things such as governments, pharaohs, the monarchy, militaries, dictators, democracies, presidents, empires, these are all man-made structures of power. And by taking the established structures of poetry and making them deteriorate, Shelley could be showing how man-made power is fallible and does not last forever. Just like Ozymandias' rule and the rule of the ancient Egyptian empire. And that's all for today's video. I hope you found it useful. And if you did, don't forget to hit the like and subscribe buttons. It really helps out with YouTube's algorithms. Thanks for watching and happy revising.